Welcome, my name is Monique Chesbro, and I'm going to be sharing with you today some practical strategies for effective instruction in the classroom. When I think back to my first experience teaching, I was fresh out of college, just coming into teaching, and it was two weeks into the school year, and I was actually substitute teaching. During that time, there was an overflow of fifth grade students at that school, and the principal had come in to watch me teach a lesson. During this time, um, she knew she was going to need, a, need to hire a new teacher, and so she offered me that position. So I had about two days to set up my classroom, and I was extremely excited. What I didn't realize, though, was what a diverse, uh, challenging group of students that I was going to be given. Each fifth grade teacher, there were 11 at the time, got to select what students they were going to send to my classroom. So as you can imagine, as a first year teacher, getting a classroom of diverse students from 11 different teachers that had already built a rapport with these students, I came across a huge challenge. And so I'm sure many of you, if you're in the classroom as an educator, educator you can think back to that first time teaching and you feel that sense of how am I going to effectively teach all these students? As I think about all the differences that we learned back in our methods classes and teaching that our students come in with, it is overwhelming. We have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that we know our students need certain uh, needs to be met in order to achieve full success. They have different learning styles. They have different cultural backgrounds, not only ethnicity, but gender and age um, and language. They also have different motivation styles, multiple intelligences, and then coming in with their own prior knowledge and prior experiences. And that's what I experienced my first day of teaching when all of these 30 kids were brought to my classroom from these different 11 classrooms that they had already been established in. And that first day, they kept raising their hand, Mrs. Chesbro, this is how Ms. Atlas does classroom management in her class. Ms. Middix does, you know, writing this way. And they all had these prior experiences that they were bringing to my classroom, and I was overwhelmed. But through this experience, it started me on my journey to figure out how do I effectively teach. And over the last 15 years, I've had a chance to not only work in the classroom with students, but also work with student teachers who are beginning their journey and guide them along their path. And so I just want to share with you today a couple of very practical things that I feel that every teacher needs to have in their back pocket so that they can effectively teach a diverse group of students because we know that every group of students that we get they are diverse and uh, there is no one student the same and that's what makes our job so wonderful but before I do that I also want to share with you one of my favorite books of all time and this was actually introduced to me through a college professor my junior year of college and so I would always tell my fifth grade students you're never too old for a good picture book um, and this picture book reminds me of what good, effective instruction is, and it actually comes from a young boy. And this book is called Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge, written by Mem Fox. And I want to share the first section with you, and um, just as an illustration to show us what good instruction looks like. It says, there once was a small boy called Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge, and what's more, he wasn't very old either. His house was next door to an old people's home, and he knew all the people who lived there. He liked Mrs. Jordan, who played the organ. He listened to Mr. Hosking, who told him scary stories. He played with Mr. Tippett, who was crazy about cricket. He ran errands for Miss Mitchell, who walked with a wooden stick. He admired Mr. Drysdale, who had a voice like a giant. But his favorite person of all, was Miss Nancy Allison Delacour Cooper, because she had four names just as he did. He called her Miss Nancy and told her all of his secrets. One day, Wilford Gordon heard his mother and father talking about Miss Nancy. Poor old thing, said his mother. Why is she a poor old thing? asked Wilford Gordon. Because she's lost her memory, said his father. It isn't surprising, said his mother. After all, she is 96. What's a memory? asked 
responsible for Gordon. He was always asking questions. It's something you remember, said his father. I'm going to stop there for a moment because I think what Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge does as he em embarks on his journey of teaching, and I'll get to how he's going to become a teacher to Miss Nancy in a bit, but what he does is what I think every good teacher needs to do, and um, this is what I also learned that first year of teaching. Our students come to us with tremendous differences, yet the key is taking a step back when we are just bombarded with um, what standards we need to teach, what new curriculum is coming down the pike, we have to take a breath and step back and do what Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge did, and that is just observe and get to know our students. We have to know what their likes are, what their dislikes are. And I think it starts there. Obviously, we know we need to know their academic uh, goals, their academic capabilities. But if we don't know them as people, it's really challenging to build a rapport with them. And if we don't have that rapport, if we don't have that bridge, then all the rest of teaching is very difficult. They start to close their ears towards us. And so we have to know our students so that they know that we care. One way that I would do this in the classroom is making sure that my classroom was student-centered. Um, that way the students are the center of our lessons the students are the ones doing the work, and as a teacher, it gives me a chance to observe my students in different realms and different uh, responsibilities. And then I would often just take a clipboard with my students' names along the side, and I would jot notes down. Because for me, having 30 kids in a fifth grade classroom, 35 kids, um, and then also rotating classrooms with some of the teachers, it's hard to remember what all these needs look like and what all these needs are in your classroom. So taking those anecdotal notes are really important and I think sometimes in the busyness of our day we might forget this and the only way we can put it back into the classroom is making sure that our students are doing the work and we are the facilitators. The second thing I did and this was simply very practical was that um, we need to listen and talk with our students and Part of my academic day on Mondays was that I would take 10 minutes and it was our mor Monday morning talks. After the weekend, you know, the students are coming in and they're a little lethargic on Mondays. And so I learned early on just to take a deep breath and step back. And what we would do is I would sit at my desk and I would let my students talk. They would get to raise their hands and they would just share with me what they did over the weekend. I learned so much about my students. I learned what movies they were watching. I learned what sports they liked. I learned what parent they might have spent the weekend with. And through that, I gained an understanding of what their background was outside of school. And it was really fun for them too because they would get to ask me, what did you do this weekend? And so I would briefly share and I became more human to them and they realized I didn't just live at school. Um, and so that was one thing that I would always do. And those 10 minutes were so worth my time because it really helped to bring my students in and build a community in my classroom. The last thing that I think we need to do as teachers is to listen and talk with our students' guardians. You know, as teachers, our sphere of influence is there in the classroom, but there's a larger sphere of influence outside of that classroom that we don't get to see. And so taking the time um, to call home when we can, uh, sending an email, somehow engaging with the parent because they really know what their student needs and um, if they're a disengaged parent it allows us to engage with them and make the year a bit more positive for their student. So those are three things that are practical, uh, easy strategies that you can do to help build rapport in the classroom. And I love it because Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge, as he was at the old folks home, you notice he took notes on all of these individuals and and what their needs were. Um, but then he focused on Miss Nancy, and that's where I'm gonna pick up with Miss Nancy. His parents told him that she had lost her memory. And so the next thing that Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge does is he figures out what he wants to teach her. And I love it though, because he does his background work. So through the next section of the book, Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge goes to each person in the 
old people's home next door, and he asked them, what is a memory? And so one lady said, it's something warm, my child, it's something warm. Mr. Hosking told him, said it's something from long ago. And then he goes on to Mr. Tippett and asks him, what's a memory? And he says, it's something that makes you cry, my boy. Something that makes you cry. And yet another Miss Mitchell said, it's something that makes you laugh. Then he called on Mr. Drysdale and asked him what a memory was, and he told him it's something as precious as gold. So Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge, during this section of the book, he does his background and he knows he has an objective in mind, and that objective is to help Miss Nancy gain her memory back. And that leads me to my next um, point. After we know our students, we have to actively plan. And this is simple and crucial. But the first one is that we know, need to know our objective and we need to communicate that with our students. You know, this little boy knew that he wanted to help Miss Nancy gain her memory back. And so he goes back through and he, he figures out what is a memory so that I have the full idea of what it is so that I can teach her effectively. I just love it. And it's that simple. But as a teacher, we need to know what we're teaching them we need to do our, our part in learning about that objective. And then we need to communicate it to our students. The next thing we need to do, point number two, is that we need to know how we're going to assess our students throughout the lesson. Now, I think one of the biggest mistakes in teaching is that we wait until the end of the hour to assess our students. But we have to be actively monitor, um, monitoring our students' progress throughout the whole entire lesson. If we're not doing that, we're losing precious time. And we all know there's not enough time in the day to get through what we uh, want to teach our students. And so this assessment isn't necessarily pencil paper. It's self-reflection. It's whiteboards. It's um, having your students interacting with one another so that you can hear conversation. It's good questioning strategies so that you know that your students are tracking. Um, if we miss this part, we miss out on so much time. And then the third thing that we need to do is we need to know how we're going to differentiate that instruction to meet all of those needs in the classroom. This seems like a daunting task, but really you can find a couple of simple strategies that you can start with and differentiation becomes easier and easier the more you know about your students and then also when you know what you can handle in the classroom. Uh, when I think about differentiation, a couple of simple strategies that I would use. Um, the first one is key, it would be my flexible grouping. Um, when I would teach math, my group would change all the time. I would teach my math lesson, we would use whiteboards, discussion, question and answer, so that I could gauge where the students were at. But then I would have them self-reflect. And I, they would, we would just use a one, two, three with our fingers right in front of our chest. And I would often just say this, if you are a one, that means you got most of your practice problems correctly on your whiteboards and you feel confident to work independently. If you are a two, that means that you got most of your practice problems right. You would like to try it on your own, but you might need some extra assistance. Or you could grade yourself a three, which means I didn't get most of my problems correctly um, on the whiteboard practice and I know I need some extra help. And so my students would just put their self-reflection fingers right in front of their chest. It would give me a gauge, and I would know because I was assessing them throughout if those were pretty accurate self-reflections. And then on the whiteboard, I would just simply write what student one group will do, what student two group will do, what um, student group three will do. And usually that third group would, would meet with me. But it was interesting because it was flexible. So some of my twos would go off and start working and then they'd realize they need help and they would come to my group. And it became this really safe grouping that my students felt they were a part of, that they were responsible for grouping themselves. And it became a very powerful tool for me uh, to use in the classroom. The next thing is having choice and variety in assignments. So making sure that when I was assigning each you know, group I could put in an enrichment problems for those who were 
high achievers. And then I could put some standard problems in with a couple of enrichment for my kids who were getting it, but um, might need some more assistance. And so that way, there was some choice there. Well, hey, I know I'm not a one. I can't do the one problems, but I can do the two. And pretty soon, I would see my, my students who thought they were two really surprise themselves and try to go on to the group one problems and actually do a really nice job. But when you empower your students with choice, you're really going to see them flourish. You know, there are times where your students maybe don't want to do um, the harder problems or the more challenging, but I find that it's actually very um, exciting for them when they come across these problems and they can actually do them, and so they're motivated. They want to do it. <clears throat> and then the last one is having differentiated assignments readily available kind of like what I was talking about with having your work on the whiteboard, but a tool that I found this year um, that I've been using often in my homeschooling with my, my children, um, because now I'm a home educator, is uh, the Evan Moore Teacher File Box it has been awesome because I have a kindergartner and a second grader who I might be teaching the same objective to, but they're at two totally different levels. So I can go onto that Teacher File Box which is all online, and I have access to hundreds and hundreds of resources through Evan Moore. And I can type in magnets, and I can get a kindergarten assignment and a second grade assignment, yet I'm teaching them both the same lesson, and then they have different assignments at the end. And I love this little comic that I'm sure you've seen before with all these little animals there um, being told to climb the tree, right? The same task for all these different animals who have different capabilities and I think sometimes we can fall into that trap as teachers, but if you can find a couple of strategies to differentiate that work for you, you, you won't fall into this trap if you're, if you're careful. So how do we know if we're effective? If you look up the word effective, it's an adjective, and it says you're successful in producing a desired or intended result. So in order to determine if we're effective, Effective, we have to know what our objective was. And if we don't have that objective laid out, we'll never know. So we need to have our objective, we need to know how we're assessing it, and then know how we're differentiating it for our students with different needs. I want to finish up this book in closing um, because I just want to encourage you with the ending of the story because I find it so sweet. Uh, Wilford Gordon, McDonald Partridge goes and he collects all of these things and puts them in a shoebox for Miss Nancy. He looked for a shoebox of shells he had found long ago last summer and put them gently in a basket. He found the puppet on strings which always made everyone laugh and he put that in the basket too. He remembered with sadness the medal which his grandfather had given him and placed it gently next to the shells. He found his football which was as precious as gold and last of all on his way to Miss Nancy's he went into the hen house to look for a fresh, warm egg under the hen. Then Wilford Gordon called on Miss Nancy and gave her each thing one by one. What a dear, strange child to bring me all these wonderful things, thought Miss Nancy. Then she started to remember. She held the warm egg and told Wilford Gordon about the tiny speckled blue eggs she had once found in a bird's nest in her aunt's garden. She put a shell to her ear and remembered how going to the beach by tram long ago was so hot and how she felt in her button-up boots. She touched the medal and talked sadly of the brother she had loved who had once gone to war and never returned. She smiled at the puppet on strings and remembered the one she had shown to her sister and how she laughed with a mouthful of porridge. She bounced the football to Wilford Gordon and remembered the day she met him and all the secrets they had told. And the two of them smiled and smiled because Miss Nancy's memory had been found again by a small boy who wasn't very old either. Every time I read that, it brings tears to my eyes because I just love it so much. But it's, for me, also encouraging to know, you know what, as teachers, just like this small boy, we can be a Wilford Gordon McDonald Partridge to all of the students sitting in, in our classroom. It takes effort, it takes time, 
but there are practical things that we can do. Thank you so much.